text for meditation this morning will be taken from our Old Testament lesson, Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 5 through 8. Thus says the Lord, cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He is like a shrub in the desert and shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness in an uninhabited salt land. Blessed is the man whose trust is in the Lord, who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes, for it leaves remain green, and it is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. This is our text for meditation. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. May his love and the comfort of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. Beloved, there is a saying that says, actions speak louder than words. And today we want to wrestle with what our actions say about where's our trust, who we trust in. I must share with you that the past two weeks for me personally have been very difficult. And I will confess to you as your pastor There have been some things that I have wrestled with in my relationship with God. More specifically, how much do I trust him? Yeah, that sounds a little crazy from the pastor, but I'm just being honest with you. Uh, February 6th, I was in a meeting uh, Wednesday evening, and my wife is in class, and typically what happens is she calls and she says, Sugar, I'm leaving campus, about to get in my car just so that I know what's going on in case I have to come be sugar, you understand? So she called me and she knew I was in a meeting, so I texted her and I said, remember, I'm in a meeting. And then I get a text immediately back and says, I was just rear-ended. Got up from the meeting, (laughs) I had to go. She was okay, you've seen her since. Car is jacked up a little bit. But here's where my problem becomes. How much Brian do I let out at this point? Because I'm ready to go in full Brian mode, but then if you've noticed, over the past couple of years, I've dropped some weight and we do a lot of head talking with people. And I realize that one of the things that I do in life when I am stressed out is I eat. Some people drink, some people smoke, some people have relations, I eat. The cheesier, the better, I'm just saying. But as I began to do my homework in my own personal journey, if I'm honest, I eat because I don't trust God. Food has a way of just putting you in that special kind of coma. And when you wake up, it better be some warm and gooey to put you right back. And so now I'm stressing out, because now what do we got to do? I'm thinking of 50 million places I need to be and she needs to be, and they're all in different directions, and now the baby drives. So we're in three different directions with two cars. How is this about to work? So before I could even get home, I was already on the phone with our insurance adjuster before they could even get the police report up. And he was like, man, we ain't even got it yet. I said, I need this done yesterday. But here's what happens. The person who hit her, their insurance company calls and says, well, we'll take responsibility, but we can't move forward because we have to complete coverage. That pantry became so awesome to me, right? Let me, but then I began to realize that that was the trigger. So I immediately, now that we're over, I will share this, it's my own spiritual journey. I immediately went into a fast. And I said, Lord, I need you to take over because I don't want to communicate that I'm not trusting you in this. Because I began to ask questions because I got to hold you accountable. What does not complete coverage mean? Listen, I watched enough Judge Judy to be dangerous. (laughs) I read between the lines. Well, um, hmm, we can't really tell you all that. So I hung up and I called my insurance adjuster. I said, what does complete coverage mean? He said, well, usually that means they have not determine how much insurance that person has to cover their damage and yours. 
had to go get a protein shake because that usually means at least two or three grilled cheese sandwiches. I'm just saying, right? So long story short, we got through that and God was able to work all of that out. But I had to realize that food was going to be the very thing that ended being my downfall. Fast forward, car will be repaired on Tuesday and a rental car and they completed the coverage. <laughs> no Judge Judy, because I sure asked the adjuster, do we have to be on Judge Judy? And he laughed at me, but. So here becomes the heart of our text. We are talking about repentance to sanctification. Are we willing to repent that there are times in our lives where we don't trust God? And we are not living according to how God wants us to live. And what are those things that we use to prevent us from trusting God, from relying on God? So before we get there, I want to ground this text for you. And so if you'd be so kind, we're going to go to Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 1 through 4, so we can understand. And family, I'm going to just be honest with you today, almost maybe eat the entire refrigerator, because this is so up, all up in huh, that uh, we're just going to talk. The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron. I want you to understand right there how serious this is. He's using a pen made with iron. He's trying to tell you that this <laughs> is going to last. With a point of diamond, and it is engraved on the tablet of their heart. Not only is it written with an iron pen and with a diamond, he wrote it on your heart. In a place that you should never forget. And on the horns of their altars. While their children remember their altars and their ashram, their sin, beside every green tree and on the high hills, on the mountains in the open country, your wealth and all your treasures I will give for spoil as the price of your high places for sin throughout all your territory. You shall loosen your hand from your heritage that I gave to you, and I will make you serve your enemies in a land you do not know. For in my anger a fire is kindled that shall burn forever. The thing that led the children of Judah into Babylonian captivity is that they had put their trust in man, in their ability, and in their wealth. And God was not happy. And he said his anger will kindle against them. Because God wants us to be reminded that he and he alone is the only place that we should put our trust. And what do our actions say about how we trust God? He is moving them from, I, I have shared with you before that we are to be in relationship with God. But now God is defining the terms of that relationship. He wants the children of Judah to understand clearly that he is the creator and you are the creation. Don't play with me. I am not happy about what is going on in our relationship and he is telling them that you are no way living up to the standard or the expectations that I have laid out for this relationship. So now we got to go have a very long time out. We ready to go to work? I was glad it was that quiet. Whew. Verse 5 says, Thus says the Lord, Cursed are those who trust in mere mortals and make mere flesh their strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. Cursed, to lose favor with God who put their trust in man. You ready for me to start drinking the coffee and I don't even drink coffee, so I hope it's something at least caramel in there, something, some fudge or something. He is talking to them about putting their trust in their man-made wealth. Can I talk to us for just a moment? I figured that was going to be by myself this morning, so I'm already prepared. 
I was already lonely. Sugar told me two weeks ago she wasn't going to be here today. <laughs> Family, as your pastor, I am challenged when we meet the number of times that I hear us say that we can't touch certain resources. Now, I know people are groaning and scrambling and squirming in their seats, but stay with me based on the text, because I want to talk about what our actions communicate. And no, by no means am I suggesting to you that scripture is saying, be frivolous. But when we say we can't, can we flesh out what we're really saying for just a moment? We are saying that we have more trust in Dow Jones than we do God. We can't. Do we understand that God has the ability to make that get up and take wings and you don't even know what happened? I would caution us, is all I'm saying, from that word that we can't do something in order to do ministry for God. Who honestly would be bold enough to say that Dow Jones has more power than God? And so here's what we begin to wrestle with. What does that really mean? I am afraid to survive. I know what it's like to be at 20 people and we can't sustain ministry. We can't pay the light bill and we don't really know how to make that transition. So I'd rather say we can't do something to ensure that that's there so I don't have to be obedient to God. Yeah, I knew it was gonna be quiet, that's all right. That's all right. I, I, and the beauty is, this is the text. I'm not making this up. We have a fear of survival. We really shouldn't have a full-time pastor. We shouldn't have staff. And so we're saying that when we do those things, God is not able to provide for us. And he's challenging them to say, listen, I am the creator, you are the creation. I was there before you even set out, and the only reason that you have that is because of me. And he's asking us to consider what it means to be cursed, to be out of God's favor, to be all alone by ourselves. Do we trust God's capacity to be God? There is a young lady who is an entrepreneur who I enjoy to follow. Uh, over Christmas break, my, my sister, her husband, and my cousin were talking about what the playlist would be like if we started moving people to the moon. And I kept arguing for this one artist. Her name is Candy Burris. And she writes a lot of music for people, but she's also a businesswoman. And she has a phrase that always sticks out with me that I think that the children of Judah and maybe even the children of Emmanuel would benefit from. She is quick to tell people that scared money don't make money. God gave it to you as a resource to do ministry. It is amazing to me the number of people that start with how much is this going to cost as opposed to what is the kingdom impact this ministry is going to have? And then watch God provide the resources necessary to do that ministry. But we try to put God in a box as if he cares anything about what happened on the stock market. He was God when you didn't have it. So what makes us think that he won't be right now? Isaiah chapter 30, verse 1. In Isaiah chapter 30, verse 1. Can you read that for me, please? I wonder how often do we come together asking God's spirit to lead and guide us as we do ministry? How often do we ask God to give us his plan before we set out on anything? Because when we follow those steps as opposed to following what other people say, we are guaranteed success. 
But that becomes foreign to us, and so he calls us rebellious children, stubborn children. Do you really want God to look at you and say, you're stubborn? You're rebellious? Let's follow his plan and not ours. In verse 6, it says, they shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when relief comes. They shall live in the parched places of the wilderness. Now, dear friends, I am no mathematician. But it says that they shall live in desert places. And they won't see when good comes to them. It amazes me, and and, and not just here so you can breathe just a little bit. When you begin to work with congregations that have been struggling and dwindling because Those good old Lutherans aren't making more Lutherans and we're all getting older and where are the people going to come from? How often people keep telling you the story of yester century. Or we keep talking about, well, we're a dying small congregation. Now again, I ain't no mathematician, but here was a very straight up, live and direct conversation. When we came to Emmanuel, y'all was worshiping 20 folks and 30 on Boulder Sunday. And my wife looked at me and she said, you really going to do this again? Because the first congregation that we got to, they had 15 on Sunday and 20 on Boulder Sunday. And now it... One, two, three. But we still tell him that same story. We are not dying, but you will die if we continue to say that over and over and over again. Please change the battery. <laughs> the light is just still flashing and you're just letting it flash. We don't even see when relief has come, is what the text says. They didn't even see that God had sent them some people to say, thus saith the Lord, and we need to repent and change our mindset and change the culture in which we operate, or this is going to lead to our spiritual destruction. And so he's asking them, are you willing to repent? Can I take you to John chapter 11, verse 44? John chapter 11, verse 44. The man who had died came out. The church who had died came out, and his hands and his feet bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind the congregation and let them go. How how, how much longer are we going to leave on our grave clothes? And at what point are we going to acknowledge that God has set us free to do some things. He has resurrected three congregations from the dead and said, go live, but yet you keep holding on to your funeral song. Do we trust him? In our own lives, let's make some personal application. God has been trying to set you free, and each time you take a step forward, how many times have you asked yourself, when is the shoe going to drop? And you won't allow yourself to enjoy what God is doing because you've been so traumatized by what happened to you in the past. Take your grave clothes off and let's walk with God. Let's begin to trust him according to his purpose and according to his will. Deuteronomy 29, verse 23. Can you read that, please? Do we really want to live in that kind of soil? In that kind of parched, barren place? Have you ever been parched? You ever been dehydrated? Dehydration causes you to do some very strange things. You become dizzy, you become lightheaded, your organs don't operate the way they're supposed to operate, and we'll stop right there. I'll let y'all figure that out. I know you got breakfast coming up. But when we're dehydrated, when we're not drinking what God has asked us to drink in terms of the water, our soil 
becomes questioned. Our soil is marginalized at best. But it's interesting to me because in this short period of conversation, Jeremiah does something that is very intentional for these people. He makes a transition and he says, blessed. Blessed are those who are planted by the water. See, it's, it's interesting as, as you consider this text. Jeremiah wants the people to know it. I, I'll give you a little bit of homework. I mean, I can't really think of what's on right now. Ben keeps telling me to watch the Bulls, and I don't know which four. They're a little worse than Cleveland, if slightly better. Uh, <laughs> Jeremiah chapter 15. And Jeremiah is having a very similar conversation with God about his own spiritual journey. And he's wrestling with why God is treating him this way. And God tells him, you need to repent as well. Don't think that just because I've asked you to go prophesy to some people who ain't doing right, that you all that in a bag of chips. And so after they have this conversation and Jeremiah repents and God begins to restore him, he goes on to now have chapter 17. I share all that to say, I'm not picking on y'all. I'm not picking on us. I am just simply somebody who had to endure this same journey personally in order for me to be able to bring it to you spiritually. I opened by confessing that there are still times in my life where I wrestle with trusting God. There are still times in my life that God has to remind me, you do understand because you thought it was all about you. I had to kick you out of some places. I want to show you what this looks like. I shared with you the first place that I was, 15 people, 20 on Sunday. But in my mind, that was a challenge because my mama built me to just be that kind of person. I'm going to go get it. 15 people, I guarantee you. Within eight months, we was at 110. <laughs> and the mayor came to speak at the church. I told him, you better not take a picture with me. <laughs> Seriously, I, I, I'm just being honest with you. But I had become convinced that it had something to do with Brian. And I will never forget it. It was a Wednesday afternoon. Every Wednesday, I would make sure that I went to the local grocery store, if you could call it that, where you can get your school clothes, your cell phone, your grocery. They had the best fried chicken ever. Whew. But here's where I knew I was outside of God's bounds. I fell asleep, feet kicked up, leaned back like nobody's business in that office because in my mind I could do this in my sleep. God spit me out of that place because of my inability to trust him to be God, because I made it about. How often do we make life about us and our ability and our unwillingness to allow God to be God? We are simply the vessels to execute what God wants him to do. And so Jeremiah is standing there telling him, I'm asking you, based on my own personal journey with God, don't do it this way. There is another way to do this. But we keep trying to do it over and over and over again our way. I'm sharing with you as your pastor, consider another way. Stop telling God what you can't and won't do. That does not please him. And God has a way of putting you in some positions to make sure that you do what you do and do it his way. I'll share this with you and then we'll close up this text real quick. As you know by now, I have shared with you my own painful journey in ministry. But the conversation that I always have with my wife, regardless of what's going on, is go see my employer. And it becomes very difficult because in that same situation, the congregation told me in October, we ain't paying you. And I looked at that woman and I said, God sent me here to serve. I did not leave there until February of that year. Yeah, yeah, you imagine what that fight was like. <laughs> mm. 
But when we are doing God's will, he didn't promise you that it was going to be a certain way. He didn't promise us as a congregation it was going to be a certain way. Now, I know this journey might not excite all of y'all, but stay with me just a moment. But in my willingness to hold on to what God had sent me to do and preach regardless of how uncomfortable it was, because that's what he asked me to do, in April of that year, got a call from Keith Haney and Mike Mass from the Northern Illinois District, because what God had set up in October when they told me they couldn't pay me was I was invited to go make a presentation for the Northern Illinois District. I don't know. And I, I'm going to tell you the true shame the devil, I cussed the entire way. Lord, because you have to understand. You have to understand something. They had just told me that they could not pay me. We had gotten a letter two months prior to that that they hadn't been paying our health insurance, and I got to go tell this woman I'm driving an hour and a half away with gas money I really don't have to do what God told me to do. President Gilbert looked me in my face and said, what do we have to do to get you to the Northern Illinois District? Keith called in April, and they asked me to come be a consultant, and then I ended up at this place called Hope Celebration. And then after Hope Celebration, by goodness, I ended up here. Now, that might excite some of y'all, might piss some of y'all off, but I'm just <laughs> sharing with you what God does when you hold on and do what he's asked you to do. It might be uncomfortable, it might be unpleasant. But Jeremiah is standing there telling these people, I've had to live this before I preach it. I'm not just here giving you some Bible verses. And it becomes uncomfortable because we like to sit in the comfort of things. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. But you didn't know that when you got up, it was about to fall apart anyway. And so he's challenging them in the gospel. Psalm 34, verse 8. This is what he's asking them to do. Can you read that? He wants them to be able to have a personal experience with the God that he serves. And he's challenging them to look within themselves and deal with that which is preventing them from leaning on God, from tasting God in his fullness. Daniel chapter 3, verse 28. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants, who trusted in him, who trusted in him, and set aside the king's command, excuse me, and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. When is that our reality? that we are going to offer up ourselves in such a way that it causes unbelievers to go in praise of the God you serve. And no, no, we're not too old for that. No, we're not too small for that. I have said it once, I'll say it again. It is not a financial issue, it's a spiritual issue. Do we trust God? And no, church folks don't like to talk about money, that's like the buzz. I ain't picking on you, just stay with me. It's like being on the golf course, and you can drive all day long. But when you get to that hole and somebody say, who's buying the round? And your buttocks start to tighten up and your hands start to sweat. Huh? You're laughing, right? That's what happens when church folks start talking about money because we have tension. And here's the tension. Let me share with you the tension. We don't like to talk about money because it becomes a they thing. And I don't like what they are doing about money. Again, it's not a money issue, it's a spiritual issue. But the challenge you have is this. In this day and age, we would all like to say money is funny and change is strange. And I don't want to enable people who ain't really doing nothing. But you want me as the pastor to come talk to us about giving and those kind of things. It becomes very difficult to do to tell somebody I want you to give when you ain't using what you got. Whether you like it or not, you gonna come ask me for some money so you can go buy some kicks and you got a need? Mm -hmm. And so he's telling them, put your trust in God. So now you're all excited because you did the math and yes, we're at verse eight. 
They shall be like a tree planted by water, sending out its roots by the stream. It shall not fear when heat comes, and its leaves shall stay green. In the year of drought, it isn't anxious, and it does not cease to bear fruit. The word is satel in Hebrew. The tree is transplanted. It is moved from a dry place to a place that provides nourishment, to a stream. It stretches out its roots, looking for that which is going to bring it life, bring it productivity. So we talked about it a little earlier. And the question becomes this, what kind of soil are you? What kind of soil are we? Matthew chapter 13, verse 8, ask us that very question. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some 60, some 30. I don't know any other way to say this. The word of God is good. So the seed ain't the problem. The problem is the soil. And we have to wrestle with what kind of seed we are. Because if we follow this, it's not a matter of fear. It's a matter of trust. And do you have a trust in God that lets you understand that no matter what comes, God's way is always the right way. E even in your own life, and I pray that you are making that application and allowing God to wrestle with you in those places where you have that anxiety. If we're listening to the text, when we have fear, when we say we can't, when we doubt, that equals death. Fear paralyzes people. Ha have you seen people just afraid of a situation and they literally cannot move? But when we have faith, it allows us to move in ways that you never thought you could possibly move. Regardless of what season it is, there will always be life. It amazed me. It because I wanted to know what they were looking for. It was cold as I don't know what several weeks ago, but yet there was birds still flying around, pecking around on the ground. Regardless of what season it was, they knew that life should still exist. Regardless of what age you are, we should still understand that when we are planted by the word of God, there is always going to be life. What are you drinking? John chapter 4, verse 15. Can you, can you read that, please? Do we understand that trusting God is not an obligation? It is a privilege, it is a gift to be able to trust God. To trust God regardless of what's going on. To know that God will have his way. God's will will be done. And it is the best thing to happen. But how often do we apply that on a daily basis? So as we close this out, it's not an issue of success. It's one of durability of livelihood, of vibrancy. And all I'm asking us to do is just based on the text, let's not end up like the children of Judah because we told God what he can't do and what we won't do. I don't know about you, but my journey with you has been very exciting. We are in places that nobody ever thought that we would ever be. I, I, I'm going to just be honest. Whoever thought that you would see two big old burly men like me and Larry hugging each other? I'm just saying, it's got to be God moving somewhere, right? But we look forward to that as brothers and sisters in Christ. If Larry don't hug you, you got a problem. Listen, what did I do wrong this week, Lord? I thought I showered. But he's asking us to just trust him along this journey.
This one happened to be about an uncomfortable subject and you want to call it money, but that's not the only area in which all of us struggle to trust God. And he's asking us to be sensitive enough when those areas come to acknowledge that and repent of those sins so that we can go deeper. In fact, he is our creator and we are the creation and he will always take care of us because that's what his word promised. He promised never to leave you nor forsake you regardless of what you're going through. Move, move from repentance to sanctification. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.